Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I have found this subject, the passage that we are about to look at in Galatians, very difficult to teach on. Probably the hardest in my life. we will be looking at one of the most strongest statements in, I believe, in all of the Word of God. Uh, to some, uh, one of the most scariest. It is a most solemn passage, a most uh, sobering few verses. It is complex, yet it is simple. We just have to make sure that our interpretation of the passage be in harmony with the rest of Scripture. There is a simplicity in its complexity. And as with every verse of Scripture, they were written for our comfort, not to frighten us, not to scare us. We are studying together in the epistle to the Galatians verse by verse, and we are at verse seven, verse 7 of chapter 1. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ. So very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word together. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, Sealing to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. The Holy Spirit has taken this opportunity to address a, man, a message to churches in Galatia, plural, Concerning legalism versus grace, it is important that we understand what the Holy Spirit is discussing when we look at the subject of legalism. It isn't that there are not responsibilities that are ours because we are members of God's family, of the household of, of God. The, the thought of legalism is that it is a means of gaining merit with God, and that's what makes it so terribly, terribly, terribly evil. Because it is Jesus Christ who gave Himself in place of us to deliver us from this present evil age, and He either did that or He did not. He either died in vain or He accomplished what He intended to accomplish. And down through the years, Christianity as a whole has presented a non-victorious Christ. Well, he tried to do it, but there are just too many who refuse to accept what he did for them, and, and dearly beloved, that is not the gospel of the grace of God. The good news is that Jesus Christ died in your place, that he was buried, and that on the third day he rose again from the dead because the price that he paid was sufficient. It is not that he started a process that you have to finish. It's that he started and finished the deliverance from this present evil world, this present evil age, and he forgave our sins because they were placed on Christ. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, in light of that, the Holy Spirit has the apostles saying that he was utterly astounded at how quickly they were moving away from the grace of God or the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And as I pointed out, that was either shortly after he left them, uh, that could be the meaning of the verse. I think more likely the meaning of the verse is that once that they were introduced to a legalistic position, they quickly moved away from the grace of God. It's inconceivable that anybody could live like you do and go to heaven. And, and that's what seems so inconceivable to the human mind. Now, you may not think like this yourself, but you can fall into the trap of applying 
legalism to others. The works of the flesh are manifest. There aren't any good, up, good ones. There aren't any good works of the flesh. There are none listed in the Word of God. They are all evil. This is so serious to the human mind that the Atheistic Society of America wrote a pamphlet or, or a tract that detailed the lives of people like Abraham and David and others, you know, Solomon with all of his wives and concubines and so forth. And the, the pamphlet closed with the, do you want to worship a God that deals in garbage? And when I read that years ago, my heart rejoiced. I mean, you know, wow, if, if, if God didn't deal in garbage, where would I be? And that's the good news. And apparently it was news accepted at Galatia because Paul calls them brethren. I certify you brethren. Verse 11, so they had accepted the good news and now they are being adulterated with adding the works of the flesh to the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that, folks, is what modern Christianity does. It's what has happened in the Christian church for 2,000 years. To add the works of the flesh to the finished work of Jesus Christ. I am utterly astounded. Imagine someone aware of the fact that Jesus paid it all, that He has delivered us from this present evil age to move quickly into the filth of human merit. That is not good news. And I pointed out the difference between the words heteros and alas. This is not good news. The reason is there are those that trouble you, and the word trouble there is to agitate mentally. It isn't that they're persecuting you physically. It's not that you're, they're throwing rocks at you, but they are agitating them mentally, and it's a present participle. They're actually doing it. It's what they will do. It's what they want to do. And they would pervert the gospel of Christ. Good works as a means of gaining merit with God is a perversion of the gospel of Christ. This is a genitive here. The gospel of Christ. I don't think it's about the gospel about, I don't think it's the gospel about Christ. I think it's the good news that Christ proclaimed. Now, it would appear that in a portion of his earthly ministry, at least, he wasn't all that tactful. As we read in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, you strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel. You're a generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? These are blunt words spoken to the religious experts of his time the leaders of what we might call the church, the, the experts, if you had a theological question, you'd go to these guys, those whom our Lord called a generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? There's nothing tactful in His message. Over and over and over again, He calls them hypocrites, because they're placing burdens on men which they themselves do not bear. It isn't that they can't, cannot. They're not even willing to try. This is a perversion of Christ's gospel. I'm going to translate the genitive as the simple possessive, and I think that's what it is in verse 7, a perversion of Christ's gospel. What God the Holy Spirit is calling a perversion is that which appears good to the human mind. It isn't evil to support a missionary activity. It's perversion to support a missionary activity in order to gain righteousness or to gain merit with God. The same act can be perversion or it can be an act of, out of love from a pure heart. That's the fine line that we draw when we speak of legalism. It isn't that we ought to avoid any sense of responsibility to our Heavenly Father. It's that we should shun like the plague 
any idea of our works gaining merit with God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Verses people always memorize. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship created upon good works. What is that? The good works of Jesus Christ, which God hath foreordained that we should walk in them. That's what Ephesians says. That God has ordained that we walk in the finished work of Christ. We ought to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called in all lowliness and meekness, esteeming others better than ourselves. That's our deliverance. That's our deliverance based upon the good works of Jesus Christ. Our own so-called good works are a perversion of Christ's gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ did not come to tell people what they needed to do to go to heaven. He came to deliver His people from their sins. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Sheep. Lost sheep. He came to call His own. He did all those things. Now, the Holy Spirit speaks very, very strong. But though we or an angel from heaven, even an angel from heaven, a messenger from heaven, should preach any other gospel unto you other than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It's a third class condition. Maybe they will or maybe they won't preach that other gospel. Though we or an angel from heaven, even me, Paul, if I were to preach anything different than that which was preached unto you, Paul includes himself. Let him be accursed. The word is anathema. As you all know, it's used various ways in the Word of God. The meaning, I believe, in this verse is cursed of God. Ye generation of vipers, how shall ye escape the damnation of hell? Now, I'm not going to try to suggest to you that every single Pharisee and priest in Matthew 20, 23 was headed for hell because I don't know. But the way that they escape the damnation of hell is not by doing works but because they're delivered by the finished work of Jesus Christ. To some of, the, of those, it, it must apply. For there's you know, Nicodemus and, and there's Paul. Paul followed very, very closely the aspects of Matthew 23 until God struck him down on the road to Damascus. And it is this... Pharisee of the Pharisees who had preached to the churches in Galatia Christ's gospel that He gave Himself in our place to deliver us from our sins, to deliver us from this present evil world or age. And now, if Paul or anyone with Paul, any angel from heaven, anybody were to preach something contrary to that, let him stand under God's curse. Folks, that's strong language. I believe God guards the finished work of Jesus Christ zealously. And we don't. We add to it. We make man's will stronger than God's will. The strongest language used, I believe, in the Word of God. It's called dung in Malachi, and He even uses language so strong that He would throw the dung in their faces. Let Him be accursed. As we said before. As we said before. Now I don't think the, the as we said before in verse 9 refers to verse 8. Some do and, and, and it may. I just don't think it does. I think the Holy Spirit is saying when Paul was at the churches in Galatia, whenever that, that was, when we were here before, we're saying the same thing now again a second time. If any man, 
and this is a first class condition, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that uh, you have received, let him be accursed. Now we're told in verse 9 that it is happening that there are those at Galatia preaching that they have to add human merit to the finished work of Christ. The language is very, very strong. It is a present imperative. I command that he be cursed of God. The other gospel there is not heteros, It's a gospel that, that is brought alongside. And so they're not denying the sacrifice of Christ. They're not moving away from preaching Christ. They're adding to it. They're bringing something in alongside of Christ's gospel. That's what man has always done. They can be anything from circumcision to baptism, church membership, tithing, uh, who knows what, but some kind of law keeping. I in no way believe that this Sunday is the Sabbath. That's, that's Saturday. But I still remember when I told my mom that I was going uh, to be fishing Sunday afternoon. And I can still hear the gasp. That legally is a bad deal. We don't bring any other gospel alongside Christ's gospel. You don't, you don't go to heaven by not playing golf on Sunday, folks. I hope you make a hole in one. A number of people have told me over the years that no professional football player ever went to heaven because they play football on Sunday. Legalism is, is very prevalent in Christianity. Humanism, that is adding to the work of Christ. It's another gospel. It's one that's brought alongside the good news concerning Jesus Christ. When one thinks about that, that is real perversion. I have good news for you. Jesus Christ died in your place so that you cannot die if you have church membership or, or you're water baptized or you tithe. And folks, that doesn't make any sense. And yet that's exactly what happens. I pointed out when we began this study, there have always been two major attacks against the finished work of Jesus Christ. One has been to add to it, you know, to say that, you know, boy, that's a good beginning. The Lord made something possible. Now, now you have to make it effective. You have, you have to bring it personally into your life. As far back as I can remember, I remember a pastor saying that, you know, well, if, if you were in a, a prison cell and uh, someone paid your fine and they unlocked the door, well, you're not free unless you walk out. Then that's wrong. I'm free whether I walk out or not. My freedom is not based upon my walking out. It's based upon the fact that the debt was paid and I'm set free. And if I'm dumb enough to sit there in the, in the cell, that has nothing to do with my freedom, only my action. If there's anything brought alongside Christ. The other attack against Christ's gospel is to take away, to subtract from the Word of God. You know, this isn't true or, or that isn't true. You know, the Bible only contains uh, the Word of God. It also contains a lot of human error. And, and the more that we can introduce any idea that this is not a trustworthy document, the more we subtract from the finished work of Christ. This ministry believes in the, the authority of Scripture. It is a trustworthy document. We may not understand much of it. That has nothing to do with its trustworthiness. Verse 10, Do I now persuade men or God, and the word is pytho, like, like this boa constrictor. You know, it's the same word that you see in Hebrews 13. Obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves to them, for they watch out for your soul. The word is be persuaded by those who have the rule over you. That's, that's the word pytho that occurs here. It is a present tense. 
Is my present attempt to persuade God? No, no, you don't persuade God. God's not going to change. I, the, I Jehovah God, change not. It, it's a good thing He doesn't change. I, the Lord, change not. So to suggest that He's persuading God doesn't seem to fit the word here. I believe, I believe that what the Holy Spirit is saying is what the Holy Spirit is having Paul preached used as something to certify God or men. Is it, the, is it the message that's certified by God or is it a message that's certified by men? Your, I don't know what translations y'all are looking at. Your translation may say, for am I now seeking the favor of men or God? I find it very difficult to find favor as a portion of the word pytho the primary meaning of pytho is to, is to persuade or to be persuaded by, and to, and to be persuaded by is where they get the meaning obey. If you're persuaded by somebody, you listen to them. Okay? So, obey makes a decent translation. The Greek word obey is the, is, is the intense form of the word hear. I'm not, so I'm not suggesting that's a wrong translation. As long as you recognize that the root is to be persuaded by. I don't think it's seeking the favor of. I, I think it's, am I certifying God's message or man's message? Is my attempt here to persuade you that it's God's message or that it's man's message? For if I yet pleased men, and that's where the translation got the idea of favorite. If I decided to seek the favor of men, I wouldn't be the servant of Christ. The word is bondservant, and it is a second class condition. If I were seeking the favor of men, and, and I am not, I wouldn't be a bond slave of Christ. On the other hand, brethren, Present tense, I am certifying you. Let me ask you a couple of questions. I just want to throw this out for your thinking. How would Paul, how would he have reacted before his conversion to the warning here of preaching another gospel? I mean, would he, would he have thought that he was cursed by God when he was always God's? set apart from his mother's womb. Did the Apostle Paul, Pharisee of Pharisees, hear or hear of Jesus telling the Pharisees that they were of their father, the devil? Is it absolutely certain that one preaching another gospel today, no matter who they are, or are anathema, accursed by God. I'm just throwing that out there for your thinking. I think you know what I think. Let, let me give you a couple of facts here. Fact. Paul preached this other gospel and murdered those who preached it, who preached the true gospel. The very one God used to pen this solemn warning. Let me give you another fact. Paul was chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world. He was set apart for God's service from the womb. Let me give you another fact. This is the most definite fact. If I had lived during his time and told him that God commanded that he be accursed for adding to or taking away from the finished work of Christ, therefore he, Paul, was accursed. If I'd said that to Paul, I'd have been dead wrong. I've concluded that the Holy Spirit is saying to the Galatian churches, they are not a generation of vipers that are going to hell, but are people, His people, brethren, who have allowed an infiltration of a perverse gospel in the fellowship. 
The Lord is, please note, the Lord is still calling them brethren. I want you to know brethren. I certify that the good news which was preached of me is absolutely not, not according to man. The, the Greek expression is down from man. Stop and think about that 11th verse for a moment. The good news which was preached of me is absolutely not according to man. All others are. All other good news is according to man. I recognize that false religions are demonic. They're the result of Satan's activity. And I believe that Satan works in those, but actually they are philosophies of men. I have no argument that Satan's behind it. And Satan works through it, but there's something wonder, wonderful beyond description, folks, about what we believe. It is absolutely unique. Even that perversion of Christianity that adds man's works to the finished work of Christ is from man. It's his logic and his reasoning. And that's been true of every other religion all down through the centuries. Sure, Baal was, was something that Satan used in his attacks against the people of God. No doubt about it. But it was a man-made religion that Satan may have empowered and used. That's true of every other philosophy. That's why it is absolutely impossible Impossible. Even, even though the academic com communities don't recognize this, it is impossible to include Christianity in a course in some Bible college on comparative religions. It's not a religion. Religion is a man-made philosophy. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a man-made philosophy. Philosophy, man's idea of who Christ is and what He did, they think is foolish. You know, well, nobody in their right mind would do what He did. You don't come as a babe. You don't allow yourself to be crucified on a cross, convicted as a criminal, and leave only a, 11 men, all of, all of whom forsook you and, and fled, and believe that that's some kind of a religious philosophy that men should accept or embrace makes a lot more sense to follow Muhammad. I'm, I'm, you know, you, you follow Muhammad. You can do anything you want to do. You can do anything you want to someone who's, who's not part of your religion. You can, you can do anything to a woman that you want. And heaven is based upon the fact that you got all the women that you want. Man, you can get a following that way. And of course, it grew, that religion grew very, very rapidly. And all, all man-made philosophies are based upon man's merit, man's attempts, man gaining something, some kind of ecstasy or, or solution to his problem. Not after man. Not after man. That is only true of the Gospel of Christ. And modern Christianity today is largely... In the main, a perversion of Christ's gospel, which is absolutely unique. Absolutely unique. It is not after man. Furthermore, this gospel that is not after man is most often considered to be after man. <laughs> Imagine that. I... Dearly beloved, it is so unique that nobody in the flesh could have ever accepted it. And it doesn't make any sense to accept it. It's, it's the work of the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who struck Paul down on the road to Damascus. It's the Holy Spirit that intervened in your life and in mine and opened our eyes to the truth. It is Christ's Gospel and it is shored up by His power and His authority. And a part of that good news is that the reason it, it is by faithfulness of Jesus Christ is in order that the promise is absolutely certain to all the seed. There's no human philosophy that can say that. 
that, that it's absolutely certain to all the seed. The promise is certain to all the seed. It, it's astounding to me how many Christians rebel at that. This certain promise to all the seed is a fact only because Jesus Christ died in their place. I mean, what do you like better? That Christ provided something and if, and if only uh, you would accept it, you'd go to hev heaven. Otherwise, you'd go to hell. Uh, so you get the, the glory and the credit? Probably. I hope not. But that's exactly the perversion that the text is talking about. It's not you. It's the finished work of, of Jesus Christ, and it's absolutely certain to all the seed. Not only do we have a unique relationship with God, we have a certain relationship with God, and I believe that the Holy Spirit wants you to have that peace and that rest and that joy. That's why any human merit is a perversion. It robs you of that that rest, that peace, and that joy that is yours in Jesus Christ. Well, it, this is going to turn out to be quite a study. I, I, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you all are too. Thank you for all your prayers, all your comments, all your participation in sharing with us the good news of Jesus Christ. Look, until next time, this is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.